I would like to acknowledge the indigenous people and the land that we are located on. We are located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ Cree, Dakota, Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. As a settler of color, I say this land acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and as a way to build relation with indigenous people who call this land home. The structure of the afternoon is as follows. This is probably the last time you're gonna see me. Um, I will introduce Noor Benu and the creator, uh, the curator of not the camera, but the filing cabinet. She will take a couple of minutes to uh, briefly explain her, her premise uh, for the exhibition. Um, the exhibition is in Gallery 1, CO3. How many people have had a chance to walk through it? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. So it is running, it is up and running until November 24th. Um, I hope you've had a chance to see it, and once you've seen it, and then go and see it again. I've popped in there this afternoon and uh, had an emotional reaction <laughs> to some of the work. Um, uh, again, being a woman of color, having gone to this university um, many, many years ago, and being one of maybe a handful of South Asian uh, women uh, in the in the hallways, it was quite wonderful uh, to see some of the artwork on the wall. Um, Noor will then introduce the artist. She was very clear with me that she wanted to uh, introduce these wonderful uh, young artists. Um, each artist will give a brief pre presentation, about roughly five minutes, not to stress all of you out. Um, and then Noor will lead the panel discussion and then there will be some questions and answers. Answers, maybe, more than questions. Um, so Noor, Noor is an emerging curator of South Asian descent. She completed her BA in the history of art and her BA of history of art and her MA in cultural studies, curatorial practices from the University of Winnipeg, where she was awarded the Queen Jubilee Diamond Jubilee Scholarship, Queen Elizabeth, sorry, Diamond Jubilee Scholarship. Uh, recently, she was the gallery program assistant at the U of M. Uh, at the School of uh, Art, um, where she curated four collections-based exhibitions. I missed all four of those. Um, and one student group show over seven months. Um, but I believe that it was one of the first times a lot of South Asian or people of color uh, artists uh, gathered. Um, I thought maybe you were laughing at me. <laughs> No, not to move um, In the fall of 2018, she began uh, her PhD in communications at, uh, and culture at Ryerson slash York University as a Ryerson graduate fellow. Not the camera, but the filing cabinet is her first exhibition as an independent curator. Please welcome Noor Fenu. So thank you everybody for coming today. Um, and thank you, Dr. Sharon Paul Rupri, for opening the discussion. Um, as you reminded us, today we are gathered together on stolen lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Metis Nation. Uh, we cannot ignore this colonial reality just uh, as we cannot ignore um, or escape our bodies, no matter how difficult it is to s exist in the world for some of us. Uh, so in search of new directions that acknowledge history and place and attempt to make sense of uh, the body in, in these conversations, uh, I put together the exhibition, Not the Camera, But the Filing Cabinet, Performative Body Archives and Contemporary Art, which will be at the Gallery 103 till, uh, until November 24th. Um, so this exhibition is my own attempt at thinking across topics of history, memory, storytelling, archival practices, and especially the body, which I understand to be the most significant vantage point through which we see and understand the world. Um, the 10 artists included in the show are Susan Iden Abbott, Jade Nasagalua Carpenter, Sarah Surisik, Dana Danger, Christina Hajar, uh, Aika Khan, Luna, Matea Radic, Sophie Sabit, and Lisa Streifler. Each artist has contributed work that is diverse in media and narrative. 
And through this diversity, they're building a case against dominant histories and oppressive monocultures that is reflective of our, of our contemporary times, where despite ongoing rep repression and marginalization, uh, feminist, queer, and other decolonial movements are gaining traction. So it's a pretty exciting show for all of us. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, the, uh, in public and private conversations, uh, the programming is really um, part of the curatorial framework where we actually get to listen to from the artists um, and mediate it. So to discuss some of the topics of the exhibition, uh, we have three artists from the exhibition, uh, Sarah Surisik, Dana Danger, and Aika Khan. I would like to begin by introducing Sarah Surisik, uh, who will uh, speak briefly about her arts practice. Sarah Surisik uh, is a visual artist exploring the relationships we have with the ground. Am I doing okay? <laughs> I thought you were laughing again. <laughs> um, so it will only one of you. <laughs> um, so uh, Sarah Surisik, uh, yeah, soil figures prominently in works that reference um, graves, voids, and death, but also that highlight the life-giving components of the earth. The heart of Surisik's practice is phot photographic. She uses the full com complement of analog, digital, and hybrid photographic practices to examine the boundaries and impact of images, and is equally interested in conceptual photography. For example, Dear Mary is a sonic pho photographic piece. Surisik was raised on a farm in northern Alber Alberta and continues to work with the land there. Although she often studies other relationships to place during uh, to place during national and international residencies, she lives in Winnipeg, where she's an assistant professor at the School of Art, University of Winnipeg. So, welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, Noor, and just a big thanks to everybody so far. Um, this exhibition is really amazing, and it's. Um, an honor to be part of it. It's, um, you know, thankfully, feminist uh, topics and feminist works do get coverage um, in our world, but I really feel that Nora has approached this in an unusual and radical and um, more comprehensive and inclusive way. So, yeah, I'm very really pleased to be involved and um, looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I feel a bit weird having had my image up here the whole time, but I always feel so exposed having a... a files instead <laughs> up on screen. You're going to see them in a minute anyway as I switch uh, back and forth between my presentation and some other um, files. But anyway, um, as Nora said, I, um, the heart of my practice is photographic. So the piece that I have in the exhibition now is um, an audio piece. It's called Dear Mary. And so at first glance, it's um, quite different than my usual photographic work. but. Um, I do think of it as a conceptual photo piece and that um, there are other links which hopefully will become more clear. So this is an old work called Steve Suresic, 1941 to 1997, Sarah Suresic, 1975, uh, dash blank. And um, I'm starting with this image because, and this uh, project, because I think that it's representative of my larger practice in general, which, um, first of all, um, usually involves photo in some way, large-scale photo. And second of all, usually is about um, uncovering stories or value that may not be at first apparent. So what might at first seem like um, just regular pieces of ground, like not very interesting pieces of ground, are actually graves. They're um, these, these are photographic reproductions of my father's grave on the left and mine my future one on the right. And um, you don't see it so much in the first image, so I just want to show a detail of how they actually, the two grave, or the two, two plots are actually quite different from one another. The, the one of my father's, because um, he was buried in it, is scarred. You can see that the ground was worked and um, altered, and mine isn't. I used to always work with the land that I grew up on and with in northern Alberta, my family's farmland. Um, then when I was in grad school in Montreal, I was invited to do a project in a gallery in the middle of Parc La Fontaine. And I had no connection to that ground, so at first I was confused about what to do. Then I, um, I decided just to start with some research to see what would come up. And I learned that the park was 
a holdout farm. So as much like most land, um, one point is, uh, well, I shouldn't say most, a lot of land, um, but in Montreal, most land was um, used for agricultural purposes at one point, and of course, farms are sold to developers or cities, whatever, and then um, used in different ways. But um, the Logan family that had the um, this farm, they were resisting that, and so the city was growing around them, and eventually they did sell. But they did they sold to the city of Montreal, and Montreal used it as a park. And while I was doing my research, I came across one um, small but very big detail that when the land um, was landscaped into the park, the top four feet of topsoil were removed or altered. And I was just so shocked by that, because that's a lot. And I decided to make this um, installation, which was an homage to um, farming practices and to just like that soil. So I built, um, I built this room inside the gallery that um, on the inside had four feet of soil on the bottom, and then on the top had the uh, reproduction of the park. So a really, I think, interesting thing about this gallery is that you have to walk through the park to get to it. So people would have just walked through this um, scene that they're seeing up on the top. Um, and then to come into this little claustrophobic room that is um, a kind of a monument or an anti-monument maybe, or a grave. And then that's just a digital maquette of the whole image. Um, this image is, uh, represents the first time that I worked with um, images of soil that was, isn't actually of a certain place. Like this is an abstracted just piece of uh, <laughs> ground, uh, which I constructed for many other negatives, because um, usually I'm shooting on large format film and then um, piecing the images together on Photoshop. And um, what I wanted to express with this uh, project, which is called Landscape, is that ongoing reference that I have to landscape and um, to have a um, like basically I just often, or I always want to get into the ground. <laughs> and so I made this piece to, to be able to do so um, with a little bit of a horizon or grass is up on top and to, to have the, the viewer um, be encompassed, have their per peripheral vision be encompassed by soil. And then the top uh, three panels were together to represent stability and then um, they're split apart at the bottom to represent the opposite. Um, more recent work, this is from a series called Fell that I've been working on the last few years. Um, it's, these voids or black holes are actually the bottoms of fallen trees. And just because of the way they're photographed, either you see the, the roots that um, have been uncovered or not. And again, they're large scale. I'm always wanting to impact the body. I'm really interested in how a physical experience can heighten an emotional experience of, um, as I started my mini presentation here with, um, the stories that are often hidden in these places or um, with, in, in people. So this is where the link for me is to this show. So even though um, I'm usually making these photographic works, I do sometimes use um, video or audio, and often am working with women and women's stories, um, particularly stories of women who are working with soil or with land that don't get told that often. So this is um, this is a video. It's a, it's a video still from um, a video that I think I'll just skip past actually to get to um, dear Mary because I think my time is running out. This is also a video still. Um, I will just play this one though because the, the, the audio clip is kind of irresistible. Um, this is a documentation shot from a project called Grounded Leaping, which I think do bring together these two main parts of the, uh, my practice that I'm referring to. So um, I work with soil and ground and then with um, stories, with women's and in this case, girls' stories. So it's an audio, I made an audio walk. Which starts with this cutie. Sorry, I was grouchy. 
What do you think is that there on your, t- in your toes as well? It's squelchy mud and it's black, uh, softy and nice. I touch it with my hand. I dig in forest school. They got lots of mud, worms and everything, and they were so ready and pinky. He he wiggles about, and he got to wear woolly boots. So what I did for this project was uh, I was in residence at an um, organic farm in England, and the farm um, just had a lot of really interesting people working for it, like someone, a person who was employed just to, not just, it's a huge project, but uh, very specific, to um, make hedges, to, to plant and grow hedges. They had a, um, a, per- a person that's just working with bees. They had a person, a cheesemonger. They had a... Um, a nutritionist, they just had tons of people. So I interviewed them about their relationship to the ground. And of course, this is a child who uh, lives on the farm. So just to segue then um, to Dear Mary, a little bit of background about it. Um, The project also came from a residency, a different residency in England, where I um, I was there to make a photographic work. I wanted to work with a, an old woman because really I just had that uh, desire to to spend some time with an old woman and to listen to some to her stories and um, learn from her. But the residency was only two weeks long, and I really um, critique the practice of just arriving at a place and like getting what you need from people, like photographing or um, videotaping or whatever, and then like probably because you only have a couple of weeks, like hurrying people along to kind of get what you need and then leaving. I think it's really exploitative. So I decided to scrap that and I started a walking project. But then when I was walking, I did meet a woman who um, really inspired me and that later agreed to just speak with me. So uh, we spent a lot of time together. I extended my residency and um, all along the way, though it didn't feel right to photograph her. So. She's well at the time she was 85, and um, when when we met each other walking, she was walking with two canes. Like she was just so fragile and so strong at the same time, and she um, really inspired me with that strength. And she, it just like the way that she impacted me wasn't visual. So this is I know partly what we'll come back to, but um, that's why I decided in the end to write the photographs that I would have taken if I had felt comfortable. Um, and to write some of the images that she had left me with, some of the ones that she had described to me. So I think I'll leave it at that. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully you'll keep that in mind then if you listen to Dear Mary, because it is 60 minutes, it's kind of long. But um, just so you know that there are these images that, um, that I came back to Canada with. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sarah. And next up, we have Dana Danger, who's based in Jojake. Uh, Dana Danger is two spirit Metis, Anishinaabe, Solto, and Polish. Uh, and through utilizing the processes of photography, sculpture, performance, and video, Danger creates works and environments that question the line between empowerment and object- objectification by claiming space with their larger than life works. Ongoing works exploring BDSM and beaded leather fetish masks explore the complicated dynamics of sexuality, gender, and power in a consensual and feminist manner. Dana ha- uh, yeah, Danger has exhibited her- their work nationally and internationally in such venues as Latitude 53, Urban Shaman Gallery here in Winnipeg, uh, Warren G. Flowers Art Gallery, DC3 Projects, uh, Roundhouse, and the New Mexico Museum of Art. Danger has participated in residencies at the Banff Center of the Arts and at Plugin Institute of Contemporary Art. Danger currently serves as a board member of the Aboriginal Curatorial Collective, and Danger, Danger is an artist in residence through uh, Initiative for Indigenous Futures at Aptech. Yeah, welcome, Dana. Is it, is it on? Okay, perfect, yeah. Usually I don't have to use a mic, but 
I'll like, it's good that there's like somebody um, managing that because I can get pretty loud. Um, oh yeah, and that the laughter is usually a common, uh, just a common thing that comes out of me, uh, whether it's I'm like happy or scared or anything. I think it's like a very matey thing to do is just like laugh forever. Everything's with infinity with us. But yeah, hi, I'm Dana Danger. So good to be back here. Chimigwich, Noor, and uh, Jennifer for bringing me out. It's a, <laughs> it a little bit of a struggle getting here. Uh, actually, super funny too. My mom had this dream that I was not going to catch my flight. And it, yeah, it definitely didn't happen. But um, yeah, but then that just made me realize that uh, either I'll figure it out or it won't. And I guess I figured it out because here I am. So it feels good to be back. Um, yeah, I guess when I think about my practice, one could say that I'm a photographer for sure. I definitely went to, did my undergrad here in photo, did my, uh, did my uh, graduate degree at uh, Concordia in photo. But I think photo is just really... Uh, kind of like medium to that kind of expressed what I what I want to get out um, yeah to the best of like uh, to the best of my abilities or like in in that way but it's also super limiting and I mean uh, I'll, it's it doesn't really speak to like all the relationship building that goes into the work I, I really I really don't ever do things alone that's like one thing for sure so whether it be the ways in which um, I'm working with folks in my work, um, all the hands that go into it, I really want that to be known. So like, for instance, there'll, there'll probably be some images of folks in beaded masks, um, people like Nicole Redstar, Trisha Livingston, uh, Rudy Now, um, myself, all these um, bead workers that made that thing happen because it's like a massive project of like these fetish masks that are completely covered in bead work, you know, um, all the time that goes into that. I think it's all the stuff that um, we don't usually talk about when we like when we look at a piece of art, like what is behind that. And usually though, how I get to where I'm going with my work is uh, through jokes or stories. Like for instance, the the work that is in this show, Gajit, um, uh, it was like really interesting how that came to be because I never imagined that I'd be making an image like that. The, that image originally comes from a series called Big Guns. Um, many, many individuals have been a part of that, um, that series. I think there's over like 60 now. Like it's a huge herd of people wearing antlers as strap-ons and like just, you know, and being all baby oiled up and stuff. Um, but I wanted to share that story too because it's, uh, I think it's like really, uh, where I'm at, at my, my practice, which is like the speaking about how we don't do things alone and what, what collaboration like looks like and pushing those boundaries, because I find myself being a person that has gone through the institution very much so, and has always felt like it was never a place that really got what I was trying to do, even though it did support me. So it was this weird kind of like juggling act of like receiving accolades, but also people like really struggling to, um, to to have my work understood in those spaces. And the places that I really understood it was around the groups that I made, uh, the groups of people and the friendships that I made. But I, and speaking of that, um, I remember going for soup dumplings, which is this Montreal phenomenon of dumplings that have soup inside of them. And they are so good. If you ever go out, there's, hit me up. I'm Dana Danger on Facebook. I'll tell you where all the best places are. It's so, it's like, you got to try it. You would think like bagels, smoked meat, no, soup dumplings, yo, it's really good. Uh, we took this elder, me and Adrian, who's in the photograph, Kajit, we took Adrian, no, we took Helen, who is from here, um, who's an amazing, she speaks her language, she's Ojibwe, and uh, she uh, helps uh, run this sun, like she helps this sun dance that uh, Adrian's a part of. So wanted to get to know her, because I know her son, and just like wanted to hang out because I get homesick all the time. Like I love being home and being back here. It feels so good. But um, I do get homesick uh, when I'm in Montreal. And so we're eating soup dumplings and I was really nervous because it's uh, the protocol and all that. I like had forgotten my tobacco, but Adrian had a huge pack in her bag. And I was like, oh my God, like I'm going to ask this elder like uh, to, na to name this work because 
this work was kind of a one-off. It was a response to the censorship of this image for the cover of Canadian art, the Kinship Magazine um, version of that photo. Uh, so I, that was at least one of the strategies that I had used, but then it originally didn't want to end up using it. It just wasn't uh, where I wanted to go with that. But I still thought it, it was a really important image and just kind of like this kind of bratty retaliation to like the, the man saying no. And so, um, yeah, so we ended up asking this elder for the word for ass because that's, you see Adrian's ass in that photo. And like, it's like, how do we say that in Anishinaabe Moen? And so we couldn't, so she sits there for a bit and uh, tells me about this book that was written by this guy named Christopher Beach. And the book is called Kijit. Um, and this book is about suicide. And it's really dark. Like we start talking about this, like, I'm like, okay. And we're just going and they're like, and also Kijit translates to like, Gajit, or like depending on your dialect, and it means, and that's the word they also use for ass. So it was like this really kind of like dark path that we went down to get to, and it just like speaks so much, I feel like, to that, the humor of indigenous folks, <laughs> to like, you know, it's like, suicide is like a fucking epidemic in many communities, but also this, um, this author that has used this title, and that's how I found out this word. Also, there was this funny meme going around that's like, is it Tanze or Anin? When it's like, you know, on Twitter or whatever, there was this thing where it sounded like two words were being said, and like, depending on how you heard it, you would hear one word or the other. And it was like this joke where you put it, it's like, is it Tanze, which is like Cree for hello, or Anin, which is like hello in Ojibwe. And they just said, Kajit, Kajit, Kajit. So you just kept saying ass over and over again. So. I feel like in the end, yeah, that's like, that's like my work, which I think is not the, maybe the version of how you wanted me to speak about my work, but that's the stories that I wanted to share today. So uh, thank you, Chimiquich. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Dana. <laughs> Uh, next up, we have Aika Khan, who's a New York-based artist uh, working in photography and digital illustration, whose work explores the experience of living within two cultures, featuring a blend of traditional South Asian motifs and symbols of American youth culture. Khan's art centers on confident brown bodies to make visible body hair and practices of body hair removal. The women in Khan's work are often seen in casual, personal, or social settings, which are underpinned by broader dialogues about South Islam, South, uh, South Asian diasporic culture, and mental health. Khan has exhibited her work at, in Alt Space, Cooper Union, and Chinatown Soup. She's currently pursuing a BFA degree at Cooper Union, New York. Welcome. Hello. I have to use a bathroom so badly. <laughs> but it's okay. Um, <laughs> wait, what did you say? I know, I'm so thirsty because I'm nervous. Um, I wanted to know if I could ask a question to the audience, like a show of hands question. Okay. Um, I guess my question is, do y'all have a heart, like, do people of color have a hard time navigating institutions? And if you do, raise your hand. Okay, cool. Um, I chose to go back to school, so it's like, I don't know, it's kind of weird being in an academic space, but like specifically here, because I'm originally a DIY artist and all of my work uh, has been done outside of school and as I'm like self-taught and everything is just kind of experimental and like, stuff I've taught myself and like made up along the way. So it's interesting to be validated by an institution and it's something that I think about a lot. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna use my Instagram as a PowerPoint. Um, talking about that meme just like bursted my energy or like made it really high. So I think looking at the Instagram interface might be good for some people. Um, so this is one of the first images that I took and uh, it's an image that I constructed in my mom's beauty salon. Um, if you came to my workshop, you're gonna hear this the same spiel again. Um, 
so yeah, so this was an image that I constructed in my mom's beauty salon, and um, I was really interested in how centered Eurocentric beauty is specifically within the South Asian community, uh, and how it really affected the formation of my idea of what it meant to be a South Asian woman. Um, I was thinking a lot about how white bodies and white stories are the mainstream narrative in the media that we consume. Um, and how it, it's like, those are kind of the mirrors that I was looking at in order to understand my own dimensionality and kind of like, um, almost assign traits to myself or like really forcing myself to feel like I could relate to this white person when really I didn't and how toxic that was for me. Um, but yeah, I was interested in like Euros, European frameworks of making art so specifically, like really popular images like uh, a still life or portraiture or self portraits, which I will get to. Um, so yeah, thinking a lot about these Europe European frameworks of making and inserting my own narrative. Um, my own culture and my own symbols that be belonged only to me. Uh, and I think like doing so is a pretty decolonial thing to do. Um, but yeah, Instagram is a really important place for me. I think it's a place where I've been able to connect with other South Asian folks and other people of color who share similar experiences to me. Um, it was important for me to connect with other South Asian folks because I was living in a place where I didn't have a lot of people around me. Um, and I was really interested in building community and kind of having almost like this online support group where I was interacting with people who shared similar experiences with me. Um, oh yeah, this is an interesting image. It's kind of out of context, but basically, yeah, also just like navigating being an artist, which is a very unconventional career for a South Asian person has been really hard. And it's like, it's an image that's gained a lot of traction, um, both IRL and URL. And it's something that I'm sure a lot of people can relate to when they choose to pursue an unconventional career, um, especially when I guess things like money aren't the center of what this job is. Uh, so yeah, my family, my family, my dad has never seen any of my work. Um, he saw one self-portrait of me, which I will show you, and he saw it on my Facebook, and then he like couldn't confront me about it because we just don't really talk, so he asked my mom to tell me to take it down, and I was like, no. Um, it was this one. Um, but yeah, my family, is not very supportive of my art because it's about me. Um, but I guess going back to community, Instagram has been, and like social media in, gen in general, has been a really important place for me uh, to connect with other South Asian folks. And it was important for me to also document our interactions and document the conversations that we were having, uh, whether offline or online. Um, I also use Instagram as a place to kind of provoke conversation or to ask questions. So I really wanted to get a tattoo and getting a tattoo is against Islam. So I kind of asked, or I put it on my Instagram story and I asked other Muslim folks what their relationship was to tattoos. And I got some really interesting responses um, that I feel like are really left out of mainstream conversations, just kind of like Muslims don't have a monolithic identity or experience. And like something as nuanced as a tattoo is a really important conversation that needs to be had. Um, but yeah, I got like a ton of responses and they were all really funny and interesting. And like all these comments from all these people just like there's so much here and there's there's so many people who have so much to say, but we don't have a space carved out for us, so we have to do it for ourselves. Um, but I will go through these really quickly because they're funny. 
Um, let's see, but if there's any part of your body. Oh yeah, this was a funny one because my mom, my mom owns a beauty salon, so she would like me to get waxed as much as possible, so she checks my body. So nothing, my body is not mine, like it's not a private space. So it was like a lot of people were telling me like, just find a secret spot. And I was like, no, that's not the problem. <laughs> yeah, okay, this one. Okay, I basically hid mine for a year. They're both on my upper arms. And then one day I was laying down and my dad saw and he was like, you know you're going to hell, right? <laughs> I never show them. <laughs> um, oh, this is a good one, but I'm not gonna read it. LOL, I wear long sleeves. That was hilarious. Um, but also what kind of came from building this community and also having an art practice was my interest in understanding the art that came from Pakistan and the art that came from South Asia. And so when I was trying to learn about that art history, I was looking online and I was like, I was trying to find different works, but I was ultimately looking for a, collect a collective space where all of, all of this information was or could be, and I wasn't finding anything. And like all of the websites I was looking at were either really, really old or really like contemporary artists who had gone through so much academia that I couldn't relate to. Um, but I compiled all this research and I started a research archive called South Asia Art. Um, and I started to share this, all these artists that I was finding and I was sharing the kind of work that they were making and I asked two of my friends to join and now we all run it together and now we are doing like a curatorial series where we ask people to come in and curate the feed for a week. So this only this archive only lives on Instagram and is only accessible on Instagram. Um, and yeah, we have curators who come in now and they curate the archive for a week with any of their information and they don't need to be an academic, they don't need to be an art historian or have any sort of like formal training. They just need to be passionate about what they do or what their interests are. So I think this archive has created more of a global dialogue around South Asian art history, but specifically the art that's being produced right now. I don't know what else to say. Um, but yeah, a lot of my documentation is of brown bodies just existing and almost trying to create mirrors for myself in order for me to understand my own, my own identity. Um, yeah, I feel like the, the psychological effects of not seeing yourself in media is so strong and so toxic. Um, and... Oh, we had our first show last year, which was really cool. Um, we had, we put together a show for one night. Oh, oh wow. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't know that had a sound. Um, but we put together our first show last year, which was really cool. We, um, we found 30, art we put together 30 artists um, from all over the world and we had one show in New York for one night. And it was really amazing. The amount of people that came and supported uh, was really impactful. This is a cool video. Um, this is my mom threading my sister in our backyard. And someone called it performance art. And I was like, yes, this is performance art. I don't know. I think the sound is really loud, so I don't want to play it. Um, oh, this is funny. Is it five minutes? Okay, I'm just gonna stop. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Is this on? Thanks so much. Okay, Aisha. thanks. Thanks for listening. Can everybody hear me from the back? Yes, perfect. Hello. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, in putting together this exhibition and uh, the programming around it, I've been sort of loosely um, working around themes of history, archives, and the body. And I was wondering, like, they're really heavy, heavy topics, and I haven't really fully fleshed them out. This is what the programming is for. Uh, so I was wondering if any of you um, wanted to talk about how you might approach these topics in your work. And we can pass around the two mics. There's another one right there. Who wanted to start? Yes. Okay. So um, when I was researching this exhibition, I was looking at uh, topics of history, the archive, memory, and the body. But um, in my work, it's been like really broad and elastic, and there hasn't been anything like definitive said about either of those topics. And I was wondering how you approach these really heavy topics in your work. History, memory, body, and archive. <laughs> well, I feel like the archive to me, and I was saying this before, is like not a heavy thing. Um, maybe, and maybe that's because my first introduction to an archive was Tumblr, and so Tumblr was the first ar like my. Th that's where I first the I first heard the word archive, and I was like, and I understood that it was like a series of images that like traveled month to month, but all of these images had everything to do with your conscious choice and like the formation of your sense of self because images now, you now associate images with your sense of self and that's what we do now like really heavily. Um, so, but, but I feel like the word archive has this like old historic association with it where it's like the archive is something that is like a database of images from like the 1800s or it's like, through an institution, it's like whatever materials through an institution, or it's like old family photographs. But now, like the archive is alive, and it's, or at least the archives that I'm consuming and the archives that I'm creating are really current, and maybe they're too current, I think, and that's something that I'm struggling with. Where, like, for example, when I go and visit my family that lives in the UK, I only get to see them every couple of years, so I'm obsessed with documenting and absorbing everything that happens between us. But I become too focused on just like trying to capture these moments that like I'm not really there. And I'm just, but I don't know, that's just a reality for a lot of millennials, so. That makes sense. Um, yeah, I want to add because my project in many ways is the opposite, but um, to back up, like, just, just specifically thinking about Dear Mary, like not about history, because you know, for me, history in, is about land and uh, colonialism, et cetera, usually with my work. But with Dear Mary um, and with a few other projects too, I was thinking much more about um, just wanting a, a model, let alone many models, you know, but I wanted at that moment a model of a, a woman who had lived life um, or a lot of life, and who did it in her own way. And that's what Mary was to me, and uh, is to me. And um, she was just so unconventional. Like one thing that, um, if you haven't heard the piece and you don't know yet, is when, when we met, she immediately started talking about Harvey. And I assumed that was her husband, or had been her husband. You know, she's Harvey, Harvey, Harvey. <laughs> And it really sounded like a human, and it turned out to be her horse, and her horse that she has had this really unusual relationship with for, for almost 30 years. And that's just, you know, one little piece, like it went on and on, like she just had such an unusual way of living. And I, that's what I wanted, um, like that's what I really needed and often still do need, and um, that kind of unorthodox way of living for me, um, uh, like just any example of people who are re resisting conventionality or resisting um, the pressure to to conform or be conventional, and so that was what was so valuable, and that's what I wanted to hold on to after um, departing from um, that situation or from meeting her. And so for me, like her history of learning how to be herself over decades, and that archive of lived knowledge um, was what I was wanting to like document, but not through images, so that after I left, I could keep some of that strength that she demonstrated and that I was hoping to kind of get from her <laughs> um, to take it with me. 
I think that's really interesting, like these perceptions that folks have. Like, I love that this person's like talking about the ho their horse. Like, I I want to I want like I want a relationship like that. <laughs> I do have that with my cats. I do talk about them like that. I, that's a cat person thing, though. I've always been a dog person, and then I had cats, and they're really interesting. And being myself, like a queer two-spirit person, I feel like there's going to be a lot of that because there's no desire for children, uh, which is also really bizarre in both my family sides because I think they're really hoping for that. But then relating, yeah, just like thinking about perceptions of like when you're talking about something or... I even think about the ways in which I relate to my kin or like um, kin perhaps rather not like not own and when I say my I don't mean like own, like in an ownership sort of like way that I like own them or anything that's not what it that's not what I mean but it's just people that are close to me and just thinking about the ways in which um, people might imagine the relationships that I have with people. Um, if you've ever seen my Instagram, which I, I love that, uh, like it's it a beautiful tool for our, and I was like, when you were saying that about Tumblr, absolutely. Tumblr was like one of those first ways, like this visual archive, which is like beyond a Pinterest board, like for sure. I never got into that, but it's like Tumblr was like really great and a, a really amazing way of communicating so many different ideas that like, far surpassed what was being talked about at an institutional level, I feel like. And they're really, they're, it's so smart. And I think that people, and it feels, um, I don't want to, like, I don't want to be surprised about that. I'm not surprised that it's very smart because like there's more than one way of like looking at a worldview and knowledge. Absolutely. Like the institution is not the be all to end all uh, for sure. Uh, I mean, for sure, like you're paying money to go somewhere and like think about things for like a long time. Uh, but you can, you, I do that all the time in like my bedroom or like with my friends or whatever. And these perceptions that we have of, rela of relating to each other and that and like, oh, um, there's so many different ideas that I have at one moment. But also just like how we, when we say body too, like this word body, this word memory, how it kind of like, um, it's more than that for me, like the person that's in that photograph or like the person that those many folks that are repeatedly, I find when I repeat myself a lot, it's because I'm trying to make sure that you're listening to what it's like, what is being said and thus why it's, why in that series in particular, there's more than 60 folks for sure. I think I've like kind of lost track, but they're all so individual, like they're all individuals while being still a collective community. Um, yeah, in that big on series. Yeah. Oh. Thoughts? Yeah, and speaking of the body, um, I was wondering, like, if all of you could talk about, like, whose story specifically you're telling, just so we have, like, a uh, context, and, like, where you locate yourself, uh, all of yourselves, in the storytelling as well. And you could talk about, like, the specific work as well, like, you know. I think that it's like, I just really want to see all of my like gorgeous friends like be documented and like for the world to see and like to take up as much space as possible is like one, one many aspect of like how I look at, at the, way, the ways in which I make work and always pushing that line of like when we're accepted and when we're not and if we even care. At the end of the day, I realized I was making work and that if you got it, great. If you didn't, then maybe it wasn't for you and that's okay if, the, if everything isn't for everyone also we can that's we can totally make there is work that's out there that I am not interested in at all but do I think that it needs to exist absolutely because I think it would be pretty boring if it was just like all one kind of like thing which it has been for a while let's be real so I'm like so open for seeing more I want abundance I don't want scarcity I'm done with it yeah I feel like I have such a detached relationship to my body and it's like I don't know, it's so strange and I don't get it, but I think with a lot of the people that I'm uh, taking photos of or taking videos of, I feel like I'm like creating mirrors for myself so I can like, it's like I'm creating, like, re like the, I'm planting these mirrors in my vision so like when I fall I can like pick myself up and I know that like there are people like me who are persisting and resisting and like, doing amazing and 
it's just like, like I have to create this world for myself because I don't feel like my body. And it's like, I don't know, it's like for so many different reasons, but it's definitely like, they are like the pillars of the form formation of my sense of self. Um, just quick answer for me. Like I'm telling Mary's story, but um, Harvey's too. And uh, <laughs> but also I just want to be realistic. You know I don't know Mary that well, and I'm, it's really my story that I'm projecting onto her and like trying to find my own um, strengths that I see. And um, but definitely I made that piece for. So in a way, it's just the story for anyone else who just wants a, like a, the models, the examples of. Um, yeah, unconventionality. Yeah, so a lot of you uh, like touched on this, like this idea of boundary making, like how far do you go into your subject's you know, body as well. Um, and with this exhibition, I've been thinking about boundaries and like there's 10 artists. It's been really difficult trying to like navigate like the abundance there because like there is like, you know, there is a need to have a lot of different bodies, a lot of different cultures, a lot of different narratives in the show. Um, but like, how do you navigate that? Like, you know, in, in your work, like, how do you draw boundaries between yourself and the subject? And like, if you wanted to talk about that, you answered it already. <laughs> well, I just, I guess one thing, and this is partly the conversation that we've just had, but you asked why audio for me, because yeah. I usually do take pictures. And I think that's the answer actually, in, in this case with that um, project is because, what I um, what I appreciate and what inspired me so much with what Mary wasn't visual. It was you know something else, it was something in, it was something inside, and so I wanted to depict it in a different way. Mm -hmm. We can think about it for a long time. <laughs> I mean, one way of like looking at boundaries because I really I tend to like really suck at them, even though I'm like into BDSM and it's all about boundaries and consent and all that sort of stuff, but in my own personal life. But one way in which I can resist that, um, which I've been taught, like we often are taught in art school, is that it feels like everything is ours to take. Um, and I didn't like that in photography at all, especially when I think of like people, like certain photographers that I just don't want to say their damn name anymore because they don't deserve it and they're dead anyway, so who cares? Um, but when they take our, uh, our narratives or they're taking our narratives and they're, they're putting their own perspectives on it, I think about what happens when, what would happen if those folks actually had a choice in how they were project, like perceived or what their narrative would be. And that I do know that there will always be a bit of myself in the images. You can't really get away with, from that. Like that, you know, uh, I'm not a neutral person. I'm also obviously making conscious decisions of who I'm asking and who I'm accepting to be in the work, but at least with certain parameters, and I think why I can get folks to do some very unconventional things in my photographs is the, that line of consent and boundary, and that like some of that work will never, the only reason I never give a disclaimer is because the, the person in the work, we've had many, uh, Adrian, I've, we've had many conversations, and that's one that I'm okay to, sh to show you, but the rest of them, no, I will never show them unless I specifically ask each person that's been in the work if I can show it during a public talk, and if they say yes, but they don't want it photographed, then I tell you, hey, during my talk, don't photograph the slides, please. Um, I can only control it so much, um, and that's why I keep all of, most of the work is not on the internet, and it's like there for you to experience in person, and sure, that's a privilege, but it's also the promise that I made and the trust that I have with the individuals, and when people don't want to be in the work anymore, yeah, they're not in the work anymore, and that's it. Like. I could look at it like, oh my God, all the time and energy that I put into there, but then, but think about all the time and energy that I've put into building relations with these people, with the people that are in, the individuals that are in my work and how important that is to me. And um, I, I sleep really good at night knowing that, so uh, I don't wanna perpetuate that stuff. So I try to counteract that the best that I can. I mean, we obviously have had to make mistakes to learn how to do that. Um, effectively, and I'm so grateful for all the people that have ever sat for me that have held my hand through that process, who have called me in, who have called me out, who I've also checked in with. All, it's complicated and it's messy, and um, that's the only way that you learn, and that's the only way that I'm here now speaking about it and openly about it. That's it. That's all. 
I, do you mind if I actually ask a question of the group too? I'm curious uh, to hear from you, but um, what strikes me there is that I relate ex the same way in terms of images, but I, um, I don't feel that way in terms of words. And um, what, you know, I'm thinking about um, these people who are writing, <laughs> well, it's very specifically, Carl, Carl of Knausgaard, if you guys know him or read him, he's, read, he's written this six volume autobiography, like a massive for like a regular person, <laughs> regular, whatever. But anyway, um, and his family has disowned him and because he's said, uh, like his whole style is about just writing everything like very directly and not filtering it. And you know, tons of people of course have done that, but um, he's getting a lot of recognition for it. And um, yeah, I just agree with him, like more or less that he should get to say what he wants to say. And, but I don't feel that way about images. I have a daughter, I'm being very, very careful about the images of, of, I've taken of her and you know, what I'm putting out there in the world. And I find myself wondering though, if that's just giving imagery too much power. And so I'm curious from, about, uh, to hear from everybody, but I'm curious, especially from you, because you said you're t detached from your body. And um, do you think like with the plethora of images that you have made that it, it yeah, takes away the power? And, of well, now I'm thinking. Right. Yeah. Well, now I'm thinking about how, regardless of what I feel, like boundaries are not in my control. So, like, I'm specifically thinking about how we now have algorithms that are checking photographs online. So, for example, on my fake Instagram account, I post a lot of nudes, and it, it, my nudes got deleted. So I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Like only five people are following me on this and they're my good friends. They would never report this photo. So, I'm, and I, I brought it up with some friends and they said that there's an, there is probably a chance that there is an algorithm that's checking for nudes. So I'm just like, that's like, how much control do I really have when it comes to exerting my idea of my body online? But I'm not going to stop. I don't know. And that control is kind of that control is also kind of like you don't have once it's on the internet, you don't have con, like it can go anywhere, right. and anybody can do anything with it. So, mm -hmm. in one way, we want to believe that our bodies can be out there and maybe not be sexualized the way that we don't want them. We want to control the gaze, the way that the gaze looks at it. But I can't control the ways in which people have been raised and their perceptions and their worldview. That seems. Mm -hmm kind of like what I'm against and I don't want to perpetuate that as well mm -hmm. and it kind of and that's like why then I resist and I'm like okay well then I guess it doesn't go out there and then it's made then there's also that argument well then you know what really are you breaking down and it's like it's not like we're not here to solve that problem it's the individuals that look at that and like right. want to jizz on those photos like I'm, and if and if they want to do that that's cool too like whatever I don't want to yuck anyone's yum but <laughs> it's got to be consensual right <laughs> Like, I don't know, man. Yeah. So I can't control that. Like, yeah. you know, if they want to sexualize those bodies, they will. They, they, folks do that. So. Yeah. I love that you sh only show those photos in person and have that IRL experience. I think that's really amazing. And I've, I've become a lot more conscious to not share certain images. And like, I don't have a, the desire to do it anymore because it's just not. Uh, sustainable and it doesn't feel good, I would say. Um, yeah, I guess my next question kind of extends this conversation on boundaries. Um, but like what is like an ideal audience in your mind? Like who is like, you know, like visually equipped to read your work or like hear your work? Like politically, culturally, I know Dana, in the one interview you said, you responded to a gallerist saying that this work isn't for you where they couldn't locate themselves in like an image? Oh yeah, it was an art critic here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was an art critic from the Winnipeg Free Press. Yeah, his name starts with an S. I've never like talked to him about it and like, cause I don't really care, but it was good to see that because some, um, I remember getting this review and be like, oh, he doesn't get it. Uh, that was the show that was at Urban Shaman, shout out. Dana Warren, the best. So much cool support. That was an amazing show, and it was great to hear that view because I was so upset at first, like some guy being like, "How is this empowering?" And I was like, I "And I was like, I'm like, how did you don't get it? You don't get it?" And then 
I realized, yeah, of course you don't get it. You're like some white guy. Yeah, you don't get, you won't get it. You won't get like any of that. You won't get why, you know, like why anybody chose to be in there. And that's okay. Like you don't have to get it. And I think that was, I kind of, I, like, I mean, I like that interview in the ways of which it just kind of like proves that. And I think that's when there was this interview that we had um, when Rosanna Deerchild was um, on this, uh, that I, I, don't, I don't know if that native radio station still exists, but um, we were having this conversation and that's when that it kind of clicked that aha moment when I was talking like this is not for you like this it just kind of like all of a sudden made sense yeah and then I just stopped caring about it they didn't care about that so much and I could let that go yeah very cathartic yeah I feel like as much as a lot of the work that I make does have a very specific audience like I'm trying to explore South Asian dimensionality and have that be for other South Asian folks I I think it's still really important for other people to familiar, familiar, familiarize themselves with this visual imagery and with these narratives, because it's like, this is normal, this should be mainstream, it's not mainstream, like we don't have any South Asian TV shows, films, like in the Western canon, we don't have anything. I mean, there, okay, there's like one, The Big Sick, but like that doesn't count, and that's, that movie sucked. But, um, and I also didn't see it, but I know it sucked. And it's, it's just messy. Don't watch that film. Um, but yeah, I think it's important for everyone to familiar, familiarize themselves with different visual imagery and just like different ways that people exist. And, and it's like, I can learn English, but like, are you going to learn my language as quick as I'm going to learn English for you, you know? I don't really feel like I have so much to add, actually. Like, I think that question makes much more sense for you guys. But, like, who, who do you still, like, imagine as, like, the ideal audience that could read your work and, like, you know? Well, it, I'm, in some ways, I'll just echo what you're saying, what you were saying, that, uh, um, yeah, I'm hoping that someone who needs some bolstering will listen. But in some ways, it's the people who don't need bolstering that, that need to hear it more. But... You know, let's be frank, it's a 16-minute audio piece. I just hope people listen. Um, I think the gallery is still going to be open after this panel, so <laughs> go listen. Go listen. Um, and I think I should make this my last question. Um, yeah, because all of you and all the artists in the show actually kind of position themselves outside the grand narrative. I'm wondering if, like, all of you, either of you, like, feel that there is a potential to like form partnerships between each other, like however like contingent or short-lived they might be, like how you see like your work talking to other work in the show. I emailed all of these questions to you. <laughs> well in advance. That was just like the check-in to see who's gonna go first. <laughs> but you know, I just, it is quite different here, of course. I'm like, it's weird. This is a weird setup, I think. Um, it's not an ideal way to have setup. a conversation. <laughs> um, and our works are so, so different. So it's, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's a challenge, of course, to like have a conversation where they're, where the threads are uh, continuing enough. But um, yeah, for me, short form, yes. But I think that's what like the point of uh, um, at this exhibition of like bringing all these things together and, um, I'm, but I see that role so much in this case has been yours because you you can connected people and connected the dots and you're fleshing it out more with a text and we're speaking about it because you brought people together. So yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I think that's definitely what the what group exhibitions like do do, um, which is cool. So like yeah, the the shortest answer ever. Yes, I think we're already doing it. So that's which is yeah. Do you feel, yeah, do you feel like you still have agency, like, you know, your work still stands on its own and there is an ability for it to, like, kind of move around and come into dialogue or overlap in a way? Like, because I wasn't there for, the, oh, God, I wasn't there for the opening, but uh, the photos that uh, were sent to me, I just loved it because um, there was a perspective, like, I just didn't know what it looked like and just the perspective and, like, I noticed how a lot of the... Um, the like the color was like somewhat all speaking to each other which was really interesting just like from those like um 
and that, that can just at least be one sort of tie. I just was like, oh, I like, I, I really, it was like really, it really, it was really satisfying. Like I was like, this is like, this is really well done. Like the way that it's all set up and how they're kind of like positioned with each other, you know, because that's a hard thing to do is like figuring out where each thing needs to like live and be and how it's positioned with what will kind of change the relation. It's like, that's a big job that curators have to do, you know, so... I just was like, I just need a lot of space. That's all I need. But um, yeah, I feel like that, that that I, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think, I didn't get to see the show, but I know that everyone is very different and everyone comes from different backgrounds. And I think that's my favorite part of the show is that it is actually intersectional. So it is gonna be exciting for me and other people to actually have the opportunity to see themselves in works by people who they might, may not share a similar cultural history with. So yes, solidarity is possible. Thank you so much uh, to everybody for making it out on a Monday afternoon. Thank you, and if you have any questions for the panelists or like any of us, just message us, DM us. Sarah still doesn't have an Instagram. That's why you're so quiet. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, we're here. And uh, the gallery should be open for another two minutes, so you can just <laughs> slip in. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, um, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.